On all of the vacuum tube projects that we've been building up to now, we've been using little LEDs as visual indicators as to whether the circuit is working or not. And while I think this is great, it's not exactly period correct. And so I started looking at what kind of period correct visual indicators were used, and usually they used uh, little neon bulbs. I would love to use neon bulbs, I think they're absolutely beautiful, but most neon bulbs have a striking voltage of at least 70 volts. And so that doesn't really work with the really low plate voltages that we're working at, which is just 24 volts. So I started looking at some other things, and, and one of the things I came across was these little halogen bulbs. And we have a pinball machine from, you know, the 50s, and it uses a ton of these. And they only run at 6 volts. So awesome, I found my visual indicator. Except halogen bulbs are extremely power hungry. They require a lot more amperage than our inverting amplifier can supply. And so I started looking around at different ways to try and maybe power one of these. And that's what I want to get into today. And it turns out that there actually is a, va a vacuum tube that can supply quite a lot of current. And well, that's, that's this little guy right here. This is a Thyrotron. And aside from just having a really cool name, I think any tube with the Tron in the name is just awesome. So a Thyrotron is really cool. It looks, other than that, it looks like just a normal, ordinary vacuum tube. But there's something really unique about these that enables them to drive quite a lot of current. So let's hop over to the bench and take a look at what this is. And maybe we can see if we can drive our little halogen bulb with one of these. So this is actually the standard schematic symbol for a Thyrotron. Uh, this one in particular is actually a Tetrode, uh, and that's because the Thyrotrons that we're gonna be playing with today, this little guy right here, is a 2D21 uh, Thyrotron, and it's a Tetrode. And so you can see it looks pretty much exactly like a normal schematic symbol for a normal Tetrode. We have, uh, on the bottom here, we have the cathode, and then on the top here we have our plate, and then we have two grids here. This one is the control grid, just like uh, normal. And then this one, in a normal tetrode, we might consider this to be a screen grid, but in a thyrotron, this is actually a shield grid. And we'll talk a bit later about what it does. One big difference you may have noticed is this black dot right here. And this black dot lets us know that this is a thyrotron. And it also is an indicator as to the primary characteristic that's different between a thyrotron and normal vacuum tube. In a normal vacuum tube, we pull the inside of the glass here to a vacuum. That's why it's called a vacuum tube. But in a Thyrotron, it's not at a vacuum. Instead, the inside of the glass here is filled with a gas. All right, so this little black dot means that the inside of the tube is filled with a gas. Now for the 2D21 that we're using, that gas is actually xenon, but there's several different types of gases that can be used. Uh, hydrogen, argon, and even mercury vapor for some of the older tubes. So let's take a look at the operation. Just like before, we have a negative charge on the cathode. So we have these electrons building up, coming off of our cathode here. And then we have a control grid. And if we give the control grid a negative charge, it has little negative electrons on it. And when these electrons flow up, they get to the negative charge of the control grid and they turn around and head back. And then there's no current flow. There's no electron flow from the cathode to the plate. So far, this is just exactly like a normal vacuum tube, except that when we start bringing our control grid to a positive charge, it starts letting these electrons pass. And when these electrons go past, they start going up to the plate. And if enough of these electrons are flowing through the tube, making it to the plate, something interesting happens. And that is that the flow of electrons through here start to excite the gas. And when they get to a certain amount of current flow, the gas ionizes. And when the gas ionizes, it essentially creates an arc between the plate and the cathode. Now in a normal vacuum tube, we're just relying on the electrons flowing through vacuum to carry any kind of current that we need. But in a thyrotron, when this arc is created, 
the electrons can flow through that and it can carry many, many, many more electrons, which means it can move a lot more current. And some really interesting things happen at this point. The control grid gets kind of uh, encased in positive ions that kind of make a, a circular encasing around it. And so the ionized gas just kind of avoids the control grid. Uh, but what this means is that the control grid is now completely ignored. So we can actually bring the charge of the control grid back down, but it has absolutely no effect on the current flowing through. So when we turn our control grid up, we start to let the electrons flow and then this arc is created. And once this arc is created, we can't stop it. The only way to stop it is to interrupt the flow of electrons, either at the plate or the cathode. We have to physically break the flow because we can't do it with just the control grid anymore. Now, the only element that we haven't talked about is the shield grid. And the shield grid uh, has a lot of different purposes and it, it does actually do what's in the name, it shields the control grid from the cathode and the plate, but it also uh, is often held at a constant potential, so usually uh, it'll be tied to the cathode down here. And it shields the control grid from the cathode and the plate. And also it helps prevent the thyrotron from requiring a very large amount of current to cause the gas to ionize and for the thyrotron to fire. Uh, and also it helps with uh, positive ion cleanup after the current has been broken from here to here, allowing the thyrotron to uh, be set up again to fire again and allowing it to operate at a higher frequency. The big takeaway here is that it's essentially like a, a switch. When we bring the control grid up, the electrons are flowing, but we're not moving any substantial current. And once we do start to move substantial current, the gas ionizes and then we're moving all of the current. And so we, we have a very interesting working characteristic out of our thyrotrons here. And they had a lot of different uses. And so we'll take a look at just essentially two of those uses today. So we have three circuits set up on the breadboard today that I want to take a look at. And uh, we'll go through and talk about each of them here in turn. And the first one is actually just a standard 6AU6 pentode that we've been using for pretty much all of our circuits. And uh, you can see it's set up a little bit differently. Our plate resistor is only 100 ohms, and we have a cathode resistor of 10,000 ohms. And then we, we pull our output off of the cathode. And this is what's called a cathode follower. And a cathode follower can actually supply a lot more current than an inverting amplifier. So I'm curious as if to a cathode follower can supply enough current to power our little halogen bulb. Uh, but I'm a little skeptical, so we've got a thyrotron set up as well. And you can see here that the thyrotron is set up very similarly to this, actually. We have a 100 ohm plate resistor, we have a uh, 1000 ohm control grid resistor, our uh, shield grid is tied to the cathode, and then the output comes out of the cathode, and then we'll use this as our load. Uh, and so this will actually just be our little light bulb. And then one end of the light bulb will go to ground and the other end will go to the cathode. And this will kind of be like our switch. We'll, we'll turn it on and turn it off and see what happens. All right, so here we have the breadboard set up. We have the 6AU6 here on the left and then the 2D21 here on the right. And uh, it's set up pretty much just how we had it laid out in our diagram before. You can see that for the 6AU6, we're set up as a cathode follower. So we have a, a quite beefy 100 ohm resistor, that's this guy right here, that comes into the plate, and then our output comes off of the cathode here. So theoretically, the only thing that's uh, causing resistance between 24 volts and our output, which is going into our little halogen bulb here, is this 100 ohm resistor and the internal resistance of the tube. So as long as the internal resistance of the tube isn't too high, we should be able to power the bulb, right? Well, 
you can see that I have my bulb set up here and it comes out of the cathode and goes to ground. And I actually just soldered some leads onto the bulb. It's not great if I ever have to replace it, but uh, it works pretty well for sticking it into the breadboard here. Now the control grid goes through a 1000 ohm resistor here around to this potentiometer. Now this potentiometer, the center pin of it goes to 24 volts. So as I turn this knob, we're increasing the amount of voltage that's going into the control grid, uh, which should be bringing the output up. If the internal resistance of the tube isn't too high, we should light up. So let's let's rotate the knob here. Uh, well, well, that's 24 volts coming straight into the control grid, which should bring our cathode up to 24 volts and light our our bulb here. But it, it's not. And, and you know, I wasn't too surprised about this. It's cathode follower, but it's uh, there's there's just not enough electrons flowing through there to keep up with the amount of current that this thing wants. Uh, and if we look in some of the IBM reference material, you can see they use cathode followers to uh, create a high current output in places, but sometimes they do it with dual triodes and they link both triodes together to get enough current flow to run whatever it is that they're trying to run. But even that has limits. So that's where our little 2D21 comes in here. So uh, let's go ahead and move our little light bulb over to the 2D21 here. All right, so we have our 100 ohm resistor here that should uh, should come off 24 volts and it goes into the plate. And uh, as we rotate this, we shouldn't see anything, shouldn't see anything. And then when there's enough current to ionize the gas inside the tube, this should turn on. And then whatever we do on this shouldn't really matter anymore. So let's, let's go ahead and give that a shot. Okay, nothing yet. Nothing yet, but we're bringing the, uh, the input voltage higher and higher. Oh, there it goes. Look at that. The, the halogen bulb came on. Uh, it's not very bright because we have a not insubstantial voltage drop through the inside of the tube. And as a matter of fact, if we're curious what the voltage drop is, we can just check the data sheet. Uh, and you can see here that on this data sheet, it says that the, uh, the voltage drop is eight volts. So we're dropping eight volts across uh, this tube. Well, I mean, you know, this is a six volt bulb. And so we have our 100 ohm resistor and the eight volt drop here to keep from blowing our, our light bulb up here. But uh, now let's see if we can turn it off. If I, if I rotate the knob here, well, you can see that that doesn't do anything. Uh, and that's because the gas is ionized. And the only way to break that ionization is to cut the current flow. So I can actually just uh, pull the bulb out, put it back in, and well, that cut the current flowing through it. And so now we can, we can do that again. Nothing, 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 bulb is on. Awesome. And then we could pull that out to cut it. Ooh, that's, that's getting kind of warm. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll run uh, these two in parallel and split the power across them to keep them from getting so hot. Uh, and that'll also drop the resistance uh, a bit. So we might be able to get a brighter bulb out of it. Let's try that right quick. All right, so now I've got these, these two 100 ohm resistors in, in parallel and that should, that should drop it to 50 ohms, but the power should be spread more evenly across them. And if we turn it on, Oh, look at that, the, the halogen bulb lit up a lot brighter. Uh, and these, these aren't getting as hot nearly as quick. Uh, well, now I can't do anything with that. So, you know, I think uh, maybe, let me pop that out, turn that off. Let's, um, let's pull this potentiometer out and just put a button in there. I mean, since we, since we don't have any kind of analog control over it, we could just replace it with a button. So now if I just hit the button, look at that, the, the light comes on, so let's, Let's turn it off again. Now, I'm getting kind of tired of pulling it out like that to turn it off. So I, I have an idea. We'll, we'll give that a shot right quick and see how that works. All right, so now we have our two resistors in, in parallel coming off of 24 volts into one pin of our little button here. Now out of that same pin, we come over to the uh, plate of our 2D21 here. So if I push this button, we should get power through these resistors, through this gray wire here into the plate, uh, and then out of the cathode into our little bulb here. So let's give that a shot. Yeah, that works. Now, if I wanna turn it off, I need to 
essentially pull the plate to ground. If I do that, that cuts off the flow of current through it and allows the gas to deionize. And so that's what the, this button does. When I push this button, uh, it pulls the plate to ground. Now that means that these two resistors will be going uh, straight through the button to ground as well. So we don't want to push and hold that button. But a quick press should disrupt the current flowing through it and allow the gas to deionize. Let's try that. Awesome, all right, so the, our, our little light turned off. Let's turn it on again, and then let's turn it off again. That's amazing, that's super cool. And actually, now that I think about it, this is essentially a set reset latch. This is our set, and this is our, our reset. Now, unfortunately, we can't reset it using another tube, so it's, it's difficult to control. We need a, a manual button, and I haven't come up with a good way to, uh, to get around that issue. But uh, this is really, really neat. That's really cool. So that's on and then that's off. That's cool. And we're powering this super power hungry halogen. So that's really cool. So if you remember, I said that there was one more circuit that I wanted to take a look at today, and that's what's gonna happen on the back half of the breadboard. But first, let's take a look at my notes and see what kind of circuit it is. All right, the third circuit that I wanna look at is a pretty interesting use of a thyrotron. And you can see here that we have something interesting drawn up here. We have essentially a transformer, and a transformer is generating uh, AC voltage, alternating current voltage. And you can see that we have one end of it coming out into the uh, plate of our thyrotron, and then we have uh, a resistor also hooked up to that output from there going into the control grid. And then coming out of that, you can see that we, we go to a plus and then we have a minus going back to the transformer up here. And then I wrote DC down here. And, and well, that, that means that this is being used as a rectifier tube. So we should theoretically be able to rectify AC voltage into DC voltage. And that's because as our, our input waveform is coming up, we bring the control grid up with it. And then the tube starts to conduct and sends the voltage out this way. And then when our waveform is coming down, once we cross zero, there's no more current flow through here. So that's essentially like we cut the thyrotron off. And so then there's no current flow going back this way. So this is kind of acting as a diode, but it has some interesting characteristics. So let's hop back to the breadboard and we'll take a look at this. Okay, so I've got my breadboard set up and this is my uh, 2D21 Thyrotron. And over here is a uh, transformer that I salvaged out of something a long time ago, I can't remember, but uh, it takes essentially line voltage, so 120 volt uh, AC in here, and it outputs uh, about 15 volts AC on here. So I've just uh, soldered some little wires that let me stab it into the breadboard. And, and actually, if we check that, uh, my little voltmeter here is set up as AC, so we should see some AC voltage on that. There we go, 15.9 volts AC. All right, so we have AC coming out of a transformer, and well, we wanna see if this will rectify it into DC. And I've got the circuit set up pretty much essentially exactly like we had uh, drawn out on our piece of paper. So it should actually be rectifying right now. And so we have this red wire that goes around the back comes into one side of our transformer. And then uh, this little red wire right up here up front is uh, the output. So this should be rectified DC, although it'll have a, a ton of ripple because I don't have any smoothing capacitors on it, but it should be DC. So I've got a little current limiting resistor and I've got an LED. And the reason I'm using an LED is that if this is DC, the LED should only light up when hooked up in one direction and shouldn't light up when hooked up in the other direction. So let's let's give that a shot. Let's let's hook the LED up like that. Look at that, the LED came on. Now the LED, I can actually see some flicker and that's the 60 hertz flicker that's coming out of our massive ripple that's coming out of our, our rectifier here. But uh, let's flip the, D, the LED around and see if it lights up. And it doesn't. Awesome, so that means that we've got rectified uh, DC coming out of this. That's really cool. All right, so we'll, we'll move the LED out of the way and we'll, we'll take a measurement. And uh, since it should be DC coming out of that, we'll put this in DC mode here. And uh, just to make sure that, you know, DC doesn't pick up any AC. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to measure the AC that's coming out of this. You can see 
yeah, it just it just doesn't recognize it on here. So that's good. That means that uh, if we have rectified DC here, we should we should see a value here. So if I put my one probe there and I put the other probe over to here. All right, look at that. We've got six and a half volts of DC coming out of that. And remember, there's an there's a, a supposed eight volt drop. Uh, within the two, but uh, we we did get some rectified DC out of that, so that's that's pretty cool. I'm I'm impressed. I'm happy with that. That's neat. Now that DC should work on our uh, little light bulb over here as well, except that our current limiting resistor is going to be just a bit too big for that. So I'll pull that out, uh, and we'll. We'll run this resistor here, uh, which is which is huge, and I'm going to have to do some finagling to make it fit correctly. We'll go there, and then if I plug this in, that should light up. Well, it does light up, but it's very, very dim. And actually, if you remember, this was coming out as a six, six or so volts uh, rectified DC, and this is a six volt um, LED, so we, we shouldn't actually need this current limiting resistor. So let's... Pop that out. We'll take this and we'll we'll hook it up there, and then we'll take this wire out. Scoot it over to here. Oh yes! Look at that. So we have a rectified DC voltage illuminating our light here. So we are rectifying into DC, and we're able to move enough current to light up this power-hungry halogen. That's really cool. So there we go. That's a couple of different uses for thyrotrons that we came across. There's a ton of different uses for thyrotrons, but these are just a, a few that I wanted to demonstrate. And I think that's really cool that we can move uh, enough current to light up this little halogen. Uh, and actually, I like the idea of using thyrotrons to rectify AC into DC because uh, I have a project coming up that I may want to uh, do some rectification on. and. Well, I have a, a ton of these little thyrotrons uh, floating around, so I might use four of these to make a full bridge rectifier. And there will be a little bit of voltage drop, but if the, if the voltage is high enough, or if we account for that, then, you know, it should be all right. So this is awesome. We have some rectified DC coming through here to power a little halogen or an LED if we wanted to. And then we have a, a very crude SR flip-flop, um, but both of which were made out of thyrotrons. So there's a lot of really interesting things you can build with thyrotrons. And so I'm, I'm going to keep playing around with these and uh, we'll, we'll see you all in the next episode.